My name is Alpen Hong, and I have been a classical concert pianist for the last 15 years. Although I didn't know I was going to be this growing up. My first career aspiration was to become a ninja. <laughs> Although my parents saw inherent aesthetic and intellectual value in classical music lessons, and so they started me on piano and violin at the age of four. Uh, like many kids, I had great difficulty practicing. The Nintendo Entertainment System came out <laughs> when I was seven years old, and there was no way that Bach, Beethoven, and Chopin could compete with Mario, Zelda, and Metroid. <laughs> but I did love performing. Uh, eventually, I decided to follow my passion, and I attended the Juilliard School and started a career in music. Early on, I realized that a great performance involved much more than simply playing the piano accurately or even dynamically. And so I sought out other great solo artists and looked at old videos of the great solo performance of history, uh, including uh, Vladimir Horowitz and Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Victor Borga and Liberace, and other great solo entertainers such as Frank Sinatra, uh, George Carlin, uh, Michael Jackson. I wanted to ascertain just what it was that allowed these incredible entertainers to instantly captivate their audience, uh, even sometimes before even singing or playing a single note or speaking a single word. It became apparent to me that a great performance starts as soon as the person steps out into view. All of us have to perform at some point in our lives. We have to interview for a job, negotiate a salary, make a toast at a wedding, uh, ask someone out on a date. But performing has to be practiced. The reason why the performing arts are so important is because it can give us the skills, anyone, to become a more effective communicator on or off the stage. The first aspect of effective live performance is physical. The projection of confidence can be just as effective as actual confidence. Uh, it confers a sense of expertise, even if the performer is suffering from horrible terror internally. And you may not realize this, but as soon as you step onto stage, the first outward manifestation of your confidence, or the lack of it, is your posture. Everyone has been to this kid's piano recital, where the kid comes out like this. Right. Now, <laughs> now, no matter who you are, how old you are, wherever you come from, when you see and you hear something like that, everybody in the room thinks the exact same thing. Oh, no. Because <laughs> you know the next hour is going to be painful. Now, the outward manifestation of posture, there's a lot of people have thought of all kinds of techniques to teach people how to carry yourself. But it's actually quite simple. Uh, would all of you uh, please stand with me? Now, first visualize a uh, string coming out the top of your head. You know, so it strings, you know, straightens your spine. Let your arms hang naturally at your sides, but rotate them out so that the inside of your elbow faces forward. Good. And just turn just your hands in. Instantly, all of you are in the exact perfect position for giving a speech, singing, or even dancing. Now, as long as I have you standing, I would like to take the opportunity to, to teach all of you how to properly bow after a performance. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of people have all of these complicated mechanisms for doing this, you know, uh, you know, take three breaths and then go to 45 degree angle, count to three, up, you know, look. No, they're just three steps. Do it with me. Forward, up, smile. <laughs> that last little bit is so critical and so often overlooked. 
Please, go ahead, sit down, thank you. The joyful expression of appreciation is that special touch that makes your audience feel like, you know, remember the feeling of the performance, even if they don't remember what you performed. There is uh, that, you know, even there may not be many opportunities in your life to actually bow, but that last step, the smile, its power cannot be overestimated. Here's a way in which posture is able to affect the outcome of performance drastically. I've been talking to high school students and telling them that there are two ways to ask someone uh, to the dance or a date. There's the one we all usually use. Hey, uh, would you like to go to the dance with me Friday? But then there's always... <laughs> I don't always dance. <laughs> but when I do, I dance with you. <laughs> no! <laughs> Now, <laughs> your prospective date probably will laugh at you, but I bet you his or her chances of saying yes have gone up by double digits. You know, a person who projects confidence, is not afraid to laugh at themselves, has a much better chance of being a fun date. Now, the next aspect I'd like to talk about, now the uh, physical projection of confidence, uh, is the first outward manifestation also is uh, when you look someone in the eye. Or if you're in a crowd like this, to shift your gaze, to maintain visual contact with many people in your audience. This captures their attention, draws them in, connects them to you. And actually, they become invested in your performance and your success. The next aspect of performing uh, I would like to talk about now is the fact that no matter how much confidence you project, it doesn't mean anything if you don't know your stuff. Um, you know, if you are not adequately prepared, uh, a lot of times, you know, you can fish around for ideas and you're not quite sure what's going to happen. But you may not realize that actually there is a method with which you can prepare yourself uh, in a way. Now, I myself, uh, and all of us who play an instrument tend to practice the same way in preparing for a performance. Right? We practice from beginning to end, beginning to end, beginning to end, over and over and over again. Oh, let's be honest with ourselves. Beginning to, ah, it's kind of hard, I don't know, I just, but I know the beginning makes you feel good. So beginning, and then you get to, ah, I'm kind of bored, I want to kind of watch TV, do something else. And then, oh, but I like the beginning, so you play the beginning again. Of course, eventually what happens is that when you go to perform it, you know the beginning well. But the further along you go, the less well you know it. And that results, of course, in these performances, right? Where the beginning is just great. But then it starts to deteriorate as time goes on. And at worst, it falls apart and stops completely. This is what we performers call a train wreck. <laughs> and it is the performer's worst fear. Now, a performer, uh, there is a way uh, to combat this horrible idea. The fact that if I, if, you know, I suggest that uh, you know, performance anxiety usually arises out of the fear that your audience is expecting such failures. But I would like to suggest that you assume that your audience, if they're in your audience, they want you to have a successful, memorable performance. And so I would like to suggest a technique also to help you get from the beginning to the end, and that is by flipping it around when you prepare. Uh, in my own experience, I learned pieces and started from the end and worked my way back to the beginning. So I would learn the, uh, the last two measures, and then the last four, and then the last six, and then the last eight. Uh, this technique had several benefits. Uh, number one, the end of every practice session was a triumph. It ended in a great conclusion. But it also put some mental flag points along the way to help you navigate through the piece. Instead of the piece being this massive, singular undertaking, it was broken up into these smaller, more manageable accomplishments. And when you eventually did put that piece on stage, the, your confidence would only build as the performance progressed. Now, I would like to take a moment to address 
the other aspect, unfortunately, that performance has, mistakes. No matter how much time and effort you put into preparing your presentation, there was always a possibility of the misnote, the memory slip, the verbal stumble. We are not computers. And in my own playing, as a classically trained pianist, I was forced to replicate a score, note for note, every marking, uh, to an exact tempo measured by a metronome. Any variation from these elements was considered an error that needed to be corrected. And this fear of making mistakes was reinforced by teacher's pencils across my knuckles and my mom yelling at me, you know, no, you're missing the notes. You're missing, you have to practice more. You could the piano. <laughs> Maybe some of you had that, mom. <laughs> and I realized that the only advice that I got as a young person about mistakes was try not to make them. Or, even worse, practice so you don't make them. <laughs> now, these little suggestions uh, didn't help when in the middle of a performance I would blank and forget where I was in the music. The performance skill that can help you deal with these inevitable moments of uncertainty is improvisation. Now, I am not talking about abandoning ship and completely winging it. Uh, this is obvious, this is actually not often helpful. What I'm talking about is understanding the framework of your presentation so that you can, if, you, if a problem arises, you can continue and find your way back on track. In music, this involves understanding the structure of your piece so that you can, if necessary, skip to a particular section and continue. In a speech, uh, understanding uh, the themes of each paragraph allows you to keep going even if individual words slip your mind. Thelonious Monk once said, there are no wrong notes. Some are just more right than others. <laughs> so, in fact, the extent of what, what uh, the impact mistakes have on a performance actually depends completely on the performer. We may not be able to control when mistakes arise, but we can control the impact of what it does to us. I would like to relate to you a story about the time uh, when improvisation saved me from not only a train wreck, but also uh, inspired perhaps the piece that I am most known for performing ever, the, my most requested piece. I was playing the variations on a theme of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star by Mozart, far from the hardest piano piece in the repertoire. But for some reason in the middle, I couldn't for the life of me remember how the rest of the variations were supposed to go. The last thing I was certain of was that I was, the last thing I played was in the key of C. And so, you know, I started, uh, uh, the only theme that came to mind in the key of C was the theme to Star Wars. <laughs> and so I played that. <laughs> and then I realized that the bass line I'd just been playing was the same as uh, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles. And so I played that. And then this left me in the key of A, and I was like, well, the only theme I can think of right now in the key of A is uh, The Legend of Zelda. So <laughs> I played that, and so on, and so on, and so forth, until uh, I arrived um, at back in the key of C, and uh, I finished with perhaps the most famous video game theme of all time. And I received perhaps the biggest standing ovation of my life. <laughs> I would like to share this piece with you right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Twinkle Twinkle Death Star.
Confidence, performance under pressure, the ability to improvise in difficult situations are critical attributes for anyone, no matter what field you work in. And that's why I think the performing arts is so important, especially for young people. The power to affect how people perceive you gives you the ability to transform the world around you. Thank you very much.